Welcome to Skeptico and the AI Truth Ethics Podcast. I have today a follow-up interview with Craig Smith. You remember a few weeks back, we had Craig on. A great guy, a real old-school professional journalism in all the best ways. Wall Street Journal guy, New York Times guy who has turned his attention to AI. And as you might imagine, if you've been following along, you know, I was bound to push Craig pretty hard on some points. And I did. And I really did this second time around. But I really like the way that he engages with stuff that he is probably not predisposed to necessarily agree with. And for me, that's what I really care about, because that's how we get to the truth. So see what you think of this one as we begin by looking at stuff that humans are bad at. That's why you're so bad at it. My husband was gambling, and yeah, he was bad at it. Are you bad at it because you don't like it? Or do you not like it because you're bad at it? It isn't the ultimate arbiter of truth that comes down and lays down the hammer. But I think anyone would objectively look at it and say, the reason that the AI we have right now is so good at this it's because humans are so bad at it. Yeah, so where are we? We're in a great place because you're feeding me all my best material here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I took a little bit of a look at Dennis Raiden, and I'm not convinced. I mean, the movement in the sensors is so slight that I'm not sure that it it says anything, but God bless him. He's out there trying. I mean, of course, it would be wonderful to prove that there's an other than physical realm or a supernatural realm. Well, there, there's a lot to unpack there. We can start by kind of bringing people back up to date on where we were, because you were great about having this conversation, being very open about it, because these are kind of harder conversations to have in the normal context of when people start talking about consciousness or free will or any of this kind of stuff. But the way we got to Dean Radin was from uh, Nick Bostrom, right? So you had done an interview with Nick Bostrom on Deep Utopia, his new book. And what I pointed out is what's embedded in that, that no one ever pulls out, is this transhumanist, you are a biological robot in a meaningless universe. There can be no meaning because... That is the logical extension of the physicalist view. If consciousness is 100% an emergent property of the brain, it cannot be otherwise. There can be no meaning by yeah. definition. Right. Personally believe, yeah. It's I just, believe we create our own meaning in our own lives in different ways. But ultimately, yeah, I think that, as I said, I... I Take the Richard Hawkins view that we're hosts for blind and dumb genes whose motivation is to self-replicate. And so we're kind of stumbling around. We've developed consciousness as a way of furthering the genes ends, but trying to figure out why we're stumbling right. around. And the fact is so, that there's so, no reason. So that doesn't, I don't think that's logically coherent. And But the good thing here is that, and this is what I think I came to talk to you about, is I think AI can get us a lot closer to hammering that out rather than two guys sitting here just hashing back, well, I think this, I think that. And I think that I've demonstrated that. But I'd go one step further. You know, uh, between the time we talked last time and the time uh, we're talking now, I interviewed um, Dr. Christoph Koch, who is the number one dog for that question. It is not Nick Bostrom. He's a philosopher at Oxford. Uh, Koch is the head of the Allen Institute. He's the guy who Obama gave a billion dollars to to say, study the mind. He's the guy who is up to date and has the most authority when it comes to consciousness. He does not share your position. He says that the physicalist view has, and, and he's in there doing brain stuff, right? He's mm -hmm. in there doing integrated information theory, I think is the, the thing, but they're looking at neural correlates and how they generate consciousness. His conclusion directly contradicts what you're saying. So the point that we had in this conversation with ours is I said, let's take it to AI. And when we did take it to AI, I think it came down 
and I'm going to share, I didn't want to do it now, but I wanted to talk to you, but I'm going to share it with, with uh, users because I think AI clearly comes down and says, yeah, the physicalist view does not hold up. It says Dean Radin, despite what you think, that his work is solid. It said Six Sigma result. I love you feed, pushed me back and said, there are no Six Sigma result. I took the abstract of the paper, put it in. I was super impressed by this. Perplexity goes, oh yeah, I can calculate that. The X, uh, the probability is this. That's a 6.4 sigma result on one and 5.7 sigma on the other. These other things like the Global Consciousness Project, that's more than six sigma. So the point is, Craig and Alex are having this discussion. And despite what you said, AI has a lot to say about sorting that out in a way that I think anyone would look at it and say, that's a real value add to that conversation. That's a major step forward. And rather than two guys just saying, well, I think this, I think that when you can feed it, the abstract of the actual paper, and it can do that calculation, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, no. I, and I said that I think there's promise. The issue is you can bias the data just in the way that you phrase a question or design the prompt and it will only answer according to the data that you want it to look at and that is a data collection problem but i think yeah if you could get all of the data all of the counter arguments all of the criticisms of for example raiden's experiments and load the whole thing in through rag or something it See, would that's that's the tomorrow claim that i i really don't favor oh. and that's because what we can demonstrate and what we did demonstrate and what i will demonstrate as part of this interview is that right now today with the lm we have we can close that gap to a large extent in terms of the ai truth use case and it is an assistant it isn't the ultimate arbiter of truth that comes down and lays down the hammer but i think anyone would objectively look at it and say well, gee, I wasn't even sure what a Six Sigma result is, let alone whether this experimental data generated that. And perplexity had no problem with that. And when you pushed back on me, then I pushed back on perplexity. And perplexity said, no, wait a minute. Go back and look at what I said. I said this connects to this. And that's where I think the point that I continue to make over and over again is that the reason that the AI we have right now is so good at this is because humans are so bad at it. We are so biased and we so regularly, routinely just abandon the basic rules of logic in terms of following a premise and following through and not being subject to all sorts of logical fallacies that we fall into. And again, it's just been demonstrated in our dialogue over and over again. Is it perfect? No. Is it still sometimes say there, there's two R's in strawberry you know, and, and that kind of stuff? No. But... Uh, what we're looking for is the same kind of assistance we get in writing, in doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, responding to emails. That same possibility is there in this AI truth use case, which is to say, take something that someone's saying and break it down and analyze if it's true. And then, you know, I added to that, I think, with a clear demonstration of where truth is being deliberately kind of violated uh, with the shadow banning thing. And just today, you know, it's because someone pushed me on the thing because I'm shadow banned by Google and I was not shadow banned when I started writing my book. I was not shadow banned and now I am shadow banned. And one of the researchers in my book, a very prominent researcher in after death communication, Dr. Julie Beischel, was shadow banned at the beginning when I was writing my book and was not shadow banned at the end. Yeah. So I had this discussion with a friend who's very prominent AI influential guy. He's like, oh, come on, you know, no, they're not really shadow banned. So I found a great example and I'll give it to folks in this interview of an astronaut, a NASA astronaut who happens to have an opinion about climate that doesn't exactly conform with what Google wants, shadow banned. You go to any of the LMs and it says, oh, yeah, that guy's a famous astronaut. And by the way, Harry has a Ph.D. from Harvard. Go ask Google. No, I don't have any information on that. 
That's you, shadow wait, banning. Wait, wait, wait. Google has no information on the guy at all. <laughs> you are engaged now. Now I got the Wall Street Journal, New York um, Times guy <laughs> engaged. I'll bring it up on the screen. Let me see if I can bring it up. Uh, can I share my screen? Because my view, and you're kind of talking on both sides. I mean, Google uses generative AI in its search at this point. Um, on the one hand, you're saying that it delivers truth. On your other hand, you're saying that it hides the truth. And and as far as shadow banning goes, you know, all of this stuff, Dean Radin and uh, the talking to the dead and shadow banning, to me, it's all fascinating stuff, but it's kind of... Uh, well, for lack of a better term, it's it's kind of conspiracy theory, and yeah, except uh, that it's true. I mean, well, Craig, well, here, I'm I, asking I, here. You can do this yourself on your no, own no. Right I now want today. you to I want you to do it from scratch on Google. Well, put I, in I can do Harrison it from scratch. Schmidt's name yeah, here. I did this an hour ago. Uh, uh, that's okay, but we're live. Do it. Go to Google and say, who is Harrison Schmidt of NASA? No, I'm not even going to say of NASA. I'm just going to say, who is Harrison Schmidt? Well, there's probably a lot of Harrison Schmidt's, but yeah. I, I'm telling you, bro, I just did it. it. This is what it's going to say. I'm not making this up, but I'm, gra I'm glad you're- No, no, not ChatGPT. I mean, Google. I'm doing ChatGPT first so that okay. you can see that ChatGPT- Yep. Now, I just did it with Google, who is Harrison Schmidt, but I'll do it again. Oh, this is uh, uh, this is Gemini. This is not Google. This is Ge who who is who is Gemini? Well, yeah, but they're two different products. Google search is no. one thing. Oh, they are not two different. Why would why how would you split hairs on that? Okay, so what does it say for the benefit of everyone who's who's listening? We just did a live demonstration. I should have had it. Read it out loud. Go, go but, to go to Google search. I, I am not going to go to Google search because here is my point. Here is my point. Uh, but first, let me let me make sure that everyone understands what just happened. I did a demonstration. I went to GBT. I said, "Who is Harrison Schmidt?" And it said, "Harrison Schmidt is an American geologist and former astronaut who flew on Apollo 17." Um, goes on to say, earned a PhD in geology from Harvard worked as a professor and a researcher. This is not someone who no, I, I understand. And now I went over to Gemini, Google, and I said, who is Harrison Schmidt? Yeah. And it and, is shadow banned Harrison Schmidt. It says, right. I can't help with that right now. I'm trained to be as accurate as possible, but I can make mistakes sometimes. This is disinformation. This is not true. This is not being truthful and transparent. And I can show you the extended dialogue where I go, you know darn well who Harrison Schmidt is. And it, I, I can share that with people. But let's be clear. This is shadow banning. Yeah. Okay. And the important distinction, let me just make this. I know I'm going on and on. But the reason not to go over to Google search is here's the whole point. M technology is changing. It's changing mm -hmm. the way that this works. They have been doing this crap Google has in search all the time, but it's hidden. You can't see it. It's obscured. Right. LM technology makes it explicit. And that's going to change the game in terms of the sustainability from a business standpoint. I think it's very close to changing the game from a legal standpoint. I don't think this is sustainable legally. Someone is going to challenge this in a way different than the way they challenge search. Yeah. Well, uh, my view on this is that Gemini is a flawed product and and they got uh, beat up when they tried to be overly politically correct and so whoever's tuning the algorithm uh, has tightened it up so anything that that smells of of controversy it won't touch I don't know anything about Harrison that. Schmidt. So, so, but you can't do that. See, this is well, what we're well, used it's to. It's a private way, company product. This is the conversation, Craig, that you should be in the middle of. Is that going to still hold up? Hey, we're a private company. We can kind of well, do I'll whatever tell you, we want. We'll, okay, decide. we'll decide, but I think also the courts will decide. 
I don't think you can do this. I think the whole thing with not, I don't think the AI sentience thing is real, but I think spiking engagement metrics is real. I think that anthropomorphizing is real. I think the level of interaction and the rights and responsibilities. AI ethics thing is real. This is a direct violation of the stated ethics and standards that Google has established. And again, I'll share with listeners, with your permission, I will add to this dialogue so that people can see the full context, that Google will go on to say, oh no, this is a direct violation of my ethics, of my values. You cannot have a corporation stating that as clearly as they are with Google Gemini and then violating it continuously. Someone is going to challenge that. Believe me, I'm not in the business of defending Google in what which in the, the Gemini answer. Uh, I can pull it up again. You can try Google search. Yeah. So click on Google search. I will not click on. Why would I trust uh, <laughs> what is becoming the, the this is going to supplant search, right? I mean, search is well, no more. Yeah. Look, so, no, but why? Why that, do I that's care? Why, why do that's... I care what Google search says when they're lying to me right here? <laughs> I have to dance around to try and find the truth. This is clearly a lie. Why the apologies for Google? Why the apologies for Gemini? We should hold. We should hold them to the ethical standard that they set for themselves. Again, they yeah. say, "Is it?" I'll ask, "Is this truthful and transparent?" Well, it's not truthful in that it says I can't help. It certainly could help. Exactly. But it's it's trained in a way that it will not help. I mean, my point is that the you know first of all, when you say in the courts, these are private company products. They they have no obligation to to. Does the New York Times have an obligation for truth? No, no, it doesn't have an obligation. It has a business interest in in the truth. I and think that's been challenged before, and it, it will be challenged again. Yeah. I mean, this is a hot issue, right? I mean, the whole fourth estate, and I think this is a super hot issue in terms of uh, particularly with this technology and whether that, uh, oh, you're, whatever you do is your own business, whether that is sustainable from a legal perspective. And I think there's a lot of legal experts that lean in and say, no, especially when you're talking about these things becoming sentient and being regarded as individual with individual human rights, it, that would clearly put them in the crosshairs but, for litigation. So but, whether that's now or later, what we have to acknowledge, Craig, this directly contradicts where you thought things were at. Things are different than what you thought. This is a clear, unequivocal example of shadow banning. They are not giving the truth. So let's talk about shadow banning because a lot of people seem to think that there's a, a team of a few hundred people that are identifying issues or individuals that they don't want to give airtime to. And I I just, I don't believe that's true. I believe that the algorithms are tweaked to and tightened to avoid promoting. And I think Gemini is, you know, that's been its problem. And then frankly, it's reason why nobody uses Gemini. People use ChatGPT, they use Perplexity, which is a wrapper around ChatGPT. They use uh, Claude uh, and other models and Gemini's losing in the marketplace because it's crap. But I, I don't think that as a private company, they have an obligation. That's my personal opinion. You can talk to a lawyer, but I don't think that this is a, a human directed effort. For example, well, of, course to it's high... a human, of course, that's a human directed yeah, effort. Yeah. And as we talked about, everything that is becoming a very fuzzy topic. What is human directed? Right. But the point is, in terms of responsibility, again, we can look no further than Google, but you can cross check it with any other LM. I did it with Pi. And clearly, this is within the realm of AI ethics, AI safety. This is what everyone, this is alignment. This is the hot issue of alignment. Everyone will acknowledge that you just can't do this. So, you know, whether they are subject to, you know, litigation at this point or whether they will be in the future, 
is really a separate issue. And as far as no one using uh, Gemini, I, I don't think Google sees it that way. I mean, they have a trillion dollar uh, interest in search. And if they lose the game in LM, the interface between LM and search or the integration of LM and search, they will be, they will be a different company. Someone sure. else will yeah. be. Yeah. Go back to that, uh, to, to Gemini. Ask, I'm just curious what it would say if you say, who is Harrison Schmidt, a uh, former NASA astronaut? I'll do you one better. Oh, you always I'll, I'll, do that. Just do no, exactly no, that. I'm not going to do exactly what you said because I've already shown that you didn't come up to speed on this. What I'm going to do, and I've done this over and over again, this is even more significant, Craig. The reason I'm going to do it is I'm going to say, can you verify this bio? Because that is the point that demonstrates it truly our shadow banning, right? Verify what this bio, bio and I'm going to paste in. Okay. Well, I'm looking at the wrong page. Just going to paste in the bio that's generated by GPT. And I'm asking Gemini to verify it. So it shouldn't be able to verify it because it just said, I don't have any information on that guy. It shouldn't then turn around and immediately verify it. But what does it do? Oh, it does even worse. Usually it verifies it. In this case, it said, I can't help with responses on elections and political figures right now. So well, evidently, Harrison Schmidt in the data is associated with conspiracy theories or something that falls within a basket that Google is suppressing. Yeah. You, you are making apologies and excuses, which you don't know whether they're true or not. Well, how do you they think? clearly violate their standards, their own standards. Yeah. You just, <laughs> so you can't say that, oh gosh, that's okay. Or, you know, oh, they just seem to make this little mistake. No. Gosh, darn it. They're not smart I'm enough. Not they're saying not good enough. I'm saying that Gemini is a bad product and they had trouble from the get go with tuning it. And they're very worried about, you know, misinformation or political bias. I don't know what their, what their parameters are. Uh, how do you think this happens? Do you think that somebody said, hey, Harrison Schmidt, we don't want anyone to know anything about him? Well, I think I'm a computer programmer. That's what I was mm -hmm. trained to do in college. That's when I went back to get my PhD. And that's what I did professionally when I came out of college. As a computer programmer and as an AI guy who had an AI company, I have an insight into how this stuff is done. No, there's not some guy going into a database and entering in a bunch of names. But the point here is we can look at the end result and we can also compare it with what they've been accused of for the yep. last 10 years, us conspiracy theorists. I can't believe you threw that term out there because this is clearly an, another example where this is a conspiracy. This is clearly a conspiracy. For the last 10 years, Google has been saying, shadow banning, oh, well, I don't know what that is. We don't do that. Demonetization, oh, we would never do that. Manipulating the narrative, oh no, what are you guys saying? We would never do that. The point, really, what I'm excited about and the reason that I wrote the book is that the LM technology has this unintended consequence of exposing the shenanigans they've been doing for the last 10 years. They didn't plan on this. And you're right. I don't want to imagine or speculate on what they're doing, but I know they're running. We both know they're running around in circles with this. They say, we got away with this shit all the time. How come everyone's calling on us now? Well, it's because before when you put me on page four of the search results for my name, I go, well, I don't know. Maybe I deserve to be on page four. Now, when you put Harrison in there and they say he doesn't, ex this NASA ast astronaut doesn't exist, you go, wait a minute, maybe what these people have been saying all along is true. Maybe the conspiracy theory is true. Did you see what uh, Zuckerberg just came out with? Speaking of the letter yeah. he just came out with today, apologizing to everyone for caving into the pressure of the Biden White House in terms of uh, their direct effort to manipulate. And so we won't do that in the future. And on um, the COVID saying we we again, we caved to pressure to uh, censor stories. We won't do that again. We held up stories for fact checking. We won't do that again. We apologize. 
Again, these are these are all the stuff that people called conspiracy theories. And here is Mark Zuckerberg in a public letter that he's posting saying, yeah, we did that. We did that with the CIA. We did that with the FBI, the Biden administration directly. And Biden, I'm not I, I am not political. So if it's a Trump administration, it doesn't matter. The White House told us to suppress this story and we did it. What was the story that he's talking about? I forget. Anyone can pull it up. It's all over the news. But there are so many different stories. I think it might have been the laptop story or whatever it was. And then there was the Russian thing. that We later found out that wasn't true, you know, all the rest. Of it. But this is Mark Zuckerberg saying, Meta, Facebook, we cave to pressure, which in a way, you got to feel for Zuckerberg. And you got to feel for, I don't know what games Google is playing, but it's a tail wag the dog kind of thing, you know. They're not the ones out. They're just saying, how do we survive going forward with all the dependency we have on, we better play along. And that's what a lot of people speculate that Zuckerberg is now looking that this is the new play along because we don't know what's going to happen. Let's not be in the crosshairs for something happening. But yeah. again, conspiracy theory, no more. It's just laid out. Yeah. Yeah. And when I was saying conspiracy theory, I wasn't referring to the fact that these algorithms suppress information. I was referring to why they're suppressing information and I'm speculating, but it would be interesting if, and I'm sure you could write a computer program to do this, uh, by prompting uh, Gemini in this case and figure out, because they're not going to tell you, figure out where these guardrails are, where the limit is, the fence and who's inside and who's outside. That would be interesting and try and figure out what is it about the people or subjects that are being fenced out? Is there some common characteristic? That, that would be very interesting. Well, I, first of all, we're doing exactly that. We're developing a, a, the, we're turning the AI truth use case into and implementation of it that looks across. And we're kind of using AI as both the arbiter of the deception and the tool for figuring out the deception, which I think is kind of interesting. As far as the overall patterns, uh, I think it becomes self-evident when you just pump enough. It's a data problem, right? So if you pump enough data through it and you just score it in a halfway decent way, then it becomes clear. I mean, yeah. Harrison's being shadow banned for his of opinions that he stated on climate. Well, you can't do that. You can't say the guy is a Harvard-trained and researcher and professor at Harvard, and you don't like his opinion on Actually, that's climate. interesting. Can you go, what, who are you using as the alternative to Gemini? It was GPT, but I mean, the guy's an astronaut. You can go to any no, of no, the no, no, I know. they all say the same but, thing. Well, I'm curious, what does GPT say call it up and ask, what are his views on climate change? Just curious whether it'll give you a straight answer or whether it'll somehow bias the answer. Well, uh, GPT, you want to do that one? Yeah. Or perplexity, either one. What views has Harrison Schmidt expressed about climate science? No. I don't know why I don't have the option to play the audio, I think, because I'm not logged in. See, yeah, you know. yeah. He's been vocal about his skepticism regarding mainstream climate science. He has questioned the extent to which human activities are contributing to climate change, arguing that global warming is not as settled as many in the scientific community suggest. Um, so again, he's really kind of a, a moderate voice here. He's not a you know, extreme voice. He's yeah. just like, hey, guys, you know, are we really sure that these models are what we think they are? Yeah, so Google must, uh, a Gemini, must have uh, just tightened the screws on. You can't on do that. Me. Can't You can't say tighten the screws. You say, they, are everybody generating. Does. Ask no, ChatGPT. No, no, there's uh, only one standard. There's only one standard. And you know what the standard is? The standard that they have established. You don't no. have to hold them to Craig's standard or no, Alex's no, no. standard. Each, hold them to their standard. They have to be truthful and transparent, and they're not. Uh, so you can't AI. say they're tightening the screws or they have. 
that's not that is not yeah. acceptable and we have to call them out for what it is well yeah i, I guess you should be using grok but uh, why because I'll use whoever is going to be truthful this no, isn't tricky no this is being truthful uh, gemini is not being truthful on a subject that you care about Ask ChatGPT. Does it? It doesn't uh, who, matter what subject. Minute, they have Chat to be truthful on everything, yeah, Craig. So this would I be know. like the New York Times saying, "Well, I'll accept this expert, even though he's not truthful on U.S. foreign policy, but he's truthful over here." If they're a liar, is a liar. This is your field. This is journalism. When someone exposes themselves as generating misinformation to this extent, distorting manipulation, they are no longer trustworthy. No, it and is this completely is... inappropriate to say, well, yeah, they're kind of totally screwing it on climate. And then you even said it's because of an issue that I care about. I only care about the truth here. Okay. Ask ChatGPT, what is the most extreme form of pornography on the internet. Okay. Before I ask, where are you going with that? Because it won't answer because that's if to use your term, shadow band, shadow band. Why would you equate the two? So that's what clearly, it is. It's no, a guardrail it's, that it's, they've no. put up. This guy is a Harvard trained geologist. No, he has yeah. a reason to speak. He has a reason to be heard. And when his voice is suppressed, if you want to pick an issue, pick an issue that like you've uh, dealt with, organ harvesting. You know no, what I mean? My there's point... a real issue where there's two parts to the discussion, not appropriate guardrails like, you know, you can ask it, how do you make a bomb or something like that? Appropriate to who? My point is oh, that every oh. LLM has guardrails or carve outs or whatever you want to call them, shadow bands for things that the company that that is managing them that's created them doesn't want to touch in shy and this has been a, a something that's always bugged me about the media's treatment of uh generative ai in china oh generative ai in china will never succeed because of the limits on speech well Shit, there's limits on speech in our country. There's limits on speech in Europe. It depends on the culture and the government that you're living under. And so in China, you can't talk about Tiananmen, you know, July 4th, uh, 1989. In ChatGPT, you can't talk about pornography. Gemini has chosen, for whatever reason, to like bring those guardrails in very tight. So there's a l big world out there that it doesn't want to touch, but that's just not a, a fair. And, and I'll, I'll put this to all the different LMs and deconstruct what you're saying. And they'll all say the same thing, Craig, I'll tell you is that it just isn't logically coherent and consistent. What you're saying, the, there, there are a whole spectrum of issues this kind of issue is a science issue and a public policy issue that is hotly debated. We need the science, we need the different voices, and we need to be able to determine uh, a truth to a certain extent. This is a mirror of what Mark Zuckerberg said today. When yeah. Mark Zuckerberg said today, like, hey, I'm getting all this pressure to uh, distort the message. We all understand that you cannot do that. That is illegal, and it is at the very least uh, uh, directly contradicts our values. But what I keep coming back to, and I think this is the rub in this, this directly contradicts the stated values of Google. Google says we would never do this, and they're doing it, and they will be held accountable. Mm -hmm. I, I can only expose it, but someone will hold them accountable in the same way that that you know, Ford dealership was held accountable when they had a chat bot that said, uh, yeah, you can come in and buy a Ford for a dollar. And they said, well, gosh, what do we do? You know, now what do we have to? It's a parallel situation here. You can't have them on one hand saying, yeah, the, uh, uh, again, in the extent of dialogue that I'll play, I, I actually got Gemini to say, well, now that you've verified this bio, then certainly if I ask the question again, who is this person? You will generate that answer. And he goes, oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm Again, I apologize for not answering it the first time. And I obviously did have access to that information because I provided the bio. And then you ask it and it doesn't do it. And then you say, isn't this shadow banning? And then it goes off and does some completely different thing. 
there's no apology for this. It's just grind, 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 push, push, push. Can't do okay, it. Okay, so uh, two things. One, you have to acknowledge that that my point that the the limits on speech, it's the same process, whether it's China on July 4th, ChatGPT on pornography, Gemini on on opposing alternative views of client, client, climate science. It's the same mechanism. Absolutely not. I mean, underlying our system is a set of laws, uh, guidelines, and no, collective I, I, I ethical know, standards. Technically, I mean, it's the same. We don't know how they've implemented the technology, right? We don't know how the technology is implemented in China. We don't know how the technology is implemented in Google. And there's a lot of flexibility. One of the things we've talked about here is that, you know, the way that this technology is implemented at Google, who has been and continues to be one of the leaders in AI, that's why it's really not viable to say that they don't they don't know how to fix this. They know how to fix it. They just don't know how to fix it in a way that maintains what they've wanted to do in terms of misinformation and distortion. That can be the only conclusion that anyone can draw because they got too many smart people that can fix it. They're just not ready to deal with yeah, the full yeah, kind. But my point is, and I know I rambled on, but the point is GPT, OpenAI, has a completely different uh, set of code for how to deal with that. And you know where that really shines through. And uh, I'll, again, I'll show this an example of one of my favorites is Pi from Inflection. And what Inflection is focused on is truly trying to deeply understand the interactions and the subtleties in language and stuff like that. And what that allows it to do, and it's really poor, like if you want to write your blog post or something like that, Claude is clearly superior. I think most people agree. If you want to do the research, uh, perplexity is the way to go, especially since you're getting the references of what the sources yep. are. But if, if you want the LM to have a deep understanding of who you are and to logically and coherently hear your argument, I think from inflection continues to be the best. And I have an ex example that I was going to publish today of the strawberry thing. You know, are there two to three hours? A pie comes to the point point, says, oh yeah, there's three. I made a mistake. I get the same point with other LLMs and I can bully them back into saying, oh no, I guess there are two. Can't do that with pie. So this is a moving scene. Like at the beginning, and then there's an email that you sent me. You said, hey, these AI truth agents, they're not there yet. And I say, hey, of course, they're going to get better, but they are there in terms of what they can do right now. So, but back to your point, yes, they are going to get a lot better. Yes, the landscape's going to change, but there's a huge opportunity here for the AI truth use case. And we've demonstrated it right here in this show. I mean, yeah, this is but, not but, truth. But how, who do you choose? Which model do you choose? Because each one is going to give you something different. Well, what it's we're doing not AI, as, as you obviously know, is not this monolithic god. It's each company has its own model, and it depends on how it's been trained, fine-tuned, whether it has RAG. So well, what we're doing at true uh, with AI truth ethics, and again, uh, this is not a commercial venture. This is a, you know, a crazy retired entrepreneur who just likes to throw money at stuff. And if there's anyone out there who wants to join and wants money to grant, I'm giving out money for people to do this because I'm passionate about the truth use case. I think it has great potential for changing things, making things better, because truth is better. Truth is spiritual, but we won't even talk about that. But the, what we're doing at AI Truth Ethics with this is it's really simple because the, the, the LMs are both the you know, the demonstrators of the technology and the demonstrators of the misuse of the technology. So if you have uh, answers from a broad spectrum of LMs that you can effectively score and compare, you yeah. really have a, an interesting data set coming back. You can say, oh, this one did this, this one did this, this one did this. And the next level, which you immediately jump to, which I think is brilliant and I'd love to get there someday, but we a lot of work to do, is what are the overall patterns now as we look and what are the strengths and weaknesses of the different models for doing different stuff? Yeah. And I told you I was involved tangentially really in a project with a Dutch journalist. And I'll introduce her to you that was working on a similar kind of project and looking at 
media narratives and trying to use LLMs to surface neglected narratives or alternative narratives because New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, they're not LLMs deciding what to focus on or what to put on the front page. And that, to me, is a really interesting idea, as is yours. Yeah. Well, well, I thought, you know, the case that we talked about yesterday uh, on the last time we spoke was fascinating when you shared with people about a story you had been working on in a I forget where it was it Lebanon or was it Afghanistan, yeah. In Afghanistan. And, and how it was kind of another twist on the Zuckerberg story. It's like you took it to the editor and said, ah, bury that one back there, Craig, because they had DOD kind of stepped in and said, Hey, wait a minute. Here's the real story, you know. And you didn't have the leverage to kind of counterbalance that in a very traditional way, you know, which is to say, well, look, I fact checked that. Here's more accurate. And what I heard you say is that that might have carried the day with your editor. Your editor, you didn't get the feeling was intentionally kind of biased. It just said, wow, well, the DOD guy seems to have really good evidence and intelligence, and I'll go with that. Actually, even worse, because no, it's just at that time, uh, DOD, Washington, trumped reporters in the field. And, you know, you're not going to claim that, that the Pentagon made a mistake because your reporter in the field says they did until it comes out that the, what the reporter said in the field. I don't remember how it turned, whether the Pentagon came out and and revised its story. I'd have to look back, but, yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's the case of, you know, could that situation be made better by an AI that was particularly focused on unbiased, logical analysis of facts? And it doesn't have to be a complete set of facts because we never have a complete set of facts. But it, could it have been your ally in saying, you know, let's take another look at this, you know, let's consider this and this. Yeah. Uh, the project that you're working on, is it uh, based on open source models? Because I think th that ultimately is the problem, is that the guardrails are being set on the proprietary models. If you have the weights from the open source models, you can do it with it. Well, I think that's an interesting question. I think by definition, the way that you, we framed up the problem, we have to be focused on the proprietary models. You know, because well, the, if the future is an open source model that has been tailored and customized to tell the truth, then we haven't gotten to the root, the root cause of the problem, which is that will we be manipulated in the future by proprietary LM technology that's super engaging, makes us feel like all these things. So that's where we, I think we need to set the focus in terms of the watchdog yeah. of uh, truth. Yeah, well, that's interesting, too, because, uh, you know, if you listen to Yann LeCun and the whole open source movement, uh, yeah, they believe that open source will ultimately trump the proprietary models, and partly for this reason. I mean, you know, I don't use Gemini. I don't trust it. I use perplexity even more than ChatGPT because I trust it more. I agree. Uh, but if there is a perplexity on Llama 3 or whatever the next Llama model or generation is, I would trust that even more uh, because you have to get away from corporate interests. I mean, that is, yeah, it'll be interesting. And I think the market will go toward the freer, more open models. I, I think the market will go towards truth. I think we all inherently value truth. And I don't think it matters where you come down on an issue. If someone is really passionate about uh, climate change on the one side or another, they're passionate about the truth. They're not passionate about climate change uh, independent of the truth. Yeah, but this is where the private companies and the proprietary models have a problem. Who makes that decision? Right. And I know that you think the pornography argument is beyond the pale, but, you know, for much of the population, there's nothing wrong with pornography. And why is it hidden from the public domain? 
in these proprietary models, the same way that alternative climate science is hidden from the public domain, because somebody has made the decision that that's bad for society, and they're not going to let their model go in that direction. And I'm not arguing for total free speech. You know, in Europe, it's illegal to deny the Holocaust. And, you know, I lived in Europe for a long time, and to me, that's perfectly logical because the alternative is, is dangerous, that society has to set these parameters, and certainly model providers have to follow those parameters. So maybe it's governments that should set those guardrails, not private companies. No, I mean, I think you're slipping back into the, I don't think that's necessary. I think most of these issues are clear. I mean, when it gets to the fringes, yeah, there's, you know, hate speech. What is hate speech? And, you know, pornography at the fringes, those points are valid. Not with climate. Not with climate. Climate is a real issue. Yeah, Not with, you know, the, the thing I did on junk science on, you know, COVID mask wearing, whether masks are efficacious in the transmission of the flu and the Yale and the Stanford study. That's on the table, man. You can't say that's off the table. It's junk science. So the range of targets that we can hit here before we run into the very... yeah. Yeah, you know, are, are plenty. And and the same is true. I mean, you just go right down the New York Times, right? Every article on there is subject to two different points of view that are probably deserve to be, you know, talked about. That's why the last time we were in, you know, I did the flat earth thing, right? Because that's like, that's a discussion. We don't need to, we don't need more truth on flat earth. You know what I mean? Uh, when you talk to a flat earth person, they'll kind of tell you, you know, oh, this helium in the things and this and that. It's like, you know what? We can kind of shelve that discussion for later. Let's talk about something that we can dig into a little bit more in more substance. Yeah. Okay. We're coming up to an hour. So we should. I'll, I'll send you the edit and kind of mash them together into a single episode, if that's okay with you. It certainly is. We will talk in the future. I really value you coming and engaging in this. So it's been terrific, Craig, and I'll be in touch and I'll get mine out on on. Number two. Okay, I'll send you this video in a few minutes here. Excellent. Thanks, Alex. Take care. Hey, where are you, by the way? Del Mar, California, outside of San Diego. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm on the other side of the country. You're in New York, right? Yeah, yeah. I got three kids who live in New York in, in FIDI. Oh, do you? Yeah. A startup. Oh, really? AI startup? Tangentially. It's a, a financial services for wills and trusts. Oh, so I got a little, sprinkle a little bit of the AI magic in there, but not much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that sounds interesting. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Thanks again to Craig Smith for joining me today. Make sure to check out his podcast, Eye on AI. It's really good. It has some great high quality guests in the AI world if you're interested in that. And he's just all around a really smart guy whose opinion matters. So I'm really glad he was on the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, take care. And bye for now.